Yeah, so, sorry, my mind is in a million different places because we're going to be gone not just one week, but two Sundays in a row, so uh, I'm making sure we got everything done and ready to go, and I'm thinking about Haiti. I'm a little jealous that I'm not going this time. This will be my first time in, I think, five years not to go, and Grace got to go with me last time, and she's ready to go be an intern, but I, I wore my Haiti colors in honor of that, um, but as Rose read, we're all sent, right? Uh, we're not just sent if we're going to a third world country. We're not just sent if we're on a mission trip. Missions is not an event. Uh, Missions is is a lifestyle. When we get filled with Jesus, um, he's going to come out of us and he's going to display his goodness and the gospel is going to be evident in our lives. And today we're going to be hearing about forgiveness. And maybe we don't think of forgiveness like this, but forgiveness is a way to proclaim the goodness of God. And we'll see this in this parable, how forgiveness is a form of missions. It's a form of saying that there's a God who is really, really good to you, um, and he's got great things for you. Forgiveness is a way of getting people's attention. In fact, it's the way that God got our attention. I mean, it's one of the ways that God got our attention. He proclaims his glory in creation. And Sonia and Grace and I are going to be driving around for two weeks in some pretty amazing creation. We're going to be in... Um, Colorado, we're going to be in Utah, we're going to be in Arizona, out in the desert, we're going to be out in California, and um, so God proclaims his glory that way, and as we're on vacation this summer, um, if you go on vacation, don't miss that, because God's speaking to you through that, but he proclaims his glory in lots of other ways, and forgiveness is one of them. So, um, by way of review, just um, kind of a test here. For those of you who were here, and it was really slim pickings last week, it's kind of slim pickings today too, but what was the, the treasure that Jesus was pointing us to last week? God's Word. So I heard some God's Word over here. God's Word, old and new. God's Word, old and new. Old and new treasures. Um, the scribe, who was a teacher of the law, filled with the Old Testament, knew it inside and out, um, who also became trained in the kingdom of heaven, the new stuff that Jesus was talking about, Jesus said that person is like a person who's full of treasure, old and new, and they, they're able to bring these treasures out at the, at the right time and show them to people and go, look at this treasure. So we're going to dig more into this treasure. And, and again, um, when we look at the Old Testament, we tend to think, okay, the, well, at least people outside of the church, especially maybe some of us in the church, go, the Old Testament... God was a God of judgment and wrath, but no, he was actually a God of amazing grace and forgiveness, just like we just sang about. Um, And so the God who is speaking to us uh, today in God's word in the New Testament is the same God. Jesus is the same God. The Old Testament was always all about him and always pointing to him all along. So uh, as we hear Jesus speak today, We're hearing that same God speaking to us. So if you want to read along with me, we're going to listen to, we're going to read from, uh, what did I say, Psalm? Matthew 18. And let's see if it works on the screen. Our screen has been doing something really weird. It goes really dim. So I do encourage you to read along uh, on your phone or on your Bible if you've got it and mark it. Um, If we're going to be people who are being filled with the kingdom, then one dose a week isn't going to cut it. Uh, And I hope that you're not just going, okay, I got my dose of Bible on Sunday, and then the rest of the week I can go without. Um, Let's let's dig into this stuff the rest of the week, even if you just have five minutes a day. Mark this stuff um, and let Jesus speak to you and read through it again. So we're going to, I am going to start in uh, verse 23 of Matthew 18. Um, uh, Sorry, no, I'll start in verse 21, because that's what we got. So Peter came up. To Jesus, And he said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, no, not seven times, but 77 times. Or some translations say 70 times seven. <clears throat> and that's not a prescriptive number, by the way, that the number seven meant something in that culture. It meant completeness. So Jesus is saying, you keep forgiving, keep forgiving. It doesn't run out. Just like my forgiveness to, y'all, to, to you, Jesus said, doesn't run out. Therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
And since he could not pay, the master ordered him to be sold. With it. This is, sounds pretty harsh, right? Ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in, in order to make up the payment. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also will my heavenly father, Jesus says, will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Um, anybody challenged by that? Um, it's, that's a challenge. Uh, so there's a, there's a very obvious, I think, surface meaning to what Jesus is saying here. And just because it's surface, that doesn't mean it's, you know, it's shallow and surface. It's something we need to hear. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it too much. But maybe there's someone in here that, that that immediate meaning of this parable is what you need to go away with today. Maybe that's what God is going to speak to you about, and he's going to say, look, God forgave you, and so go and forgive others. And that's what you need to leave with, and that's what God is speaking to you about right now. And if that's what God is speaking to you about, then listen. Um, because even when God challenges us with something that sounds difficult and challenging, um, it's good. It's good, good stuff. But that's not what I'm going to dwell on today. I want to dwell on kind of two uh, just below the surface kinds of things going on here um, because there is so much depth to Jesus' words. And the first thing that I want to dwell on is, uh, and focus on is the fact that forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness is costly. We tend to think as Christians, and let me back up here. We have taken, in America, we have taken Christianity and and wrapped it up in American culture. And American culture says uh, life should be easy for you. And you should have everything you want, everything you need with minimal effort. Uh, You shouldn't have to invest much into stuff. The, The goal, the dream is to find the thing that I don't have to invest in much and I get a whole lot back on it. And that's the way we think as Americans. And so we take forgiveness, we take what Jesus gives us, and we go, thank you, Jesus, I'll take that. And now I get to have heaven and I get all this stuff here too. Thank you. And we go, forgiveness is free, amazing grace. That's so awesome. Thank you, God, for free forgiveness, right? But it's not free. Um, Forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness is free for the recipient, but it's not free for the giver of forgiveness. That's kind of one of the definitions of forgiveness, Um, that forgiveness means there has been a brokenness that has happened in a relationship, and in in this case, Jesus is using a financial metaphor, and we can use that too, Uh, but there's been some kind of brokenness that needs to be repaid. Forgiveness means the one to whom that brokenness was, was given, the one who incurred the brokenness doesn't have to pay for it, the other person pays for it. When we look at the, okay, so the amount of money that Jesus is talking about in these parables, uh, let's put them into modern day terms. In modern day terms, the first servant, anybody want to take a crack at how much money he was forgiven, put in American dollars today? What? A million? A hundred? Y'all are both real far. Um, Six billion dollars. Translates to roughly six billion dollars. Uh, I can't remember what it says, 10,000 talents, I think. That translates to, in today's dollars, about $6 billion. So that's, that's a chunk of change, right? I don't have $6 billion laying around. The amount of money that the first servant forgave the second servant was, on the other hand, equivalent to about $12,000. Now, is that a small amount? I, I was hoping somebody would say yes, and I'd 
come ask you, could I have, could I have $12,000? Because that be a, that's, that's a chunk of change to me. I could put that to work. There's some things in my house that need doing. Um, so it's not a small chunk of change, $12,000. Um, but if we look at this parable from the perspective of the king who gave forgiveness to the first servant and not from the perspective of the servant, we look at it from the perspective of the king, this king was out a whole lot of money. When that king forgave that debt, that was costly to him. He was going, okay, I'm never going to see that $6 billion again. It's gone, and I'm going to forgive you that debt. That was a gift, and it was very, bless you, Aaron. Uh, that was a costly gift. Forgiveness is very, very costly. We can't look at the cross and say that forgiveness was cheap or free. Uh, because forgiveness cost Jesus everything. The forgiveness that he gave us was free for us, but it cost him everything. And we humans can't even wrap our minds around what it cost him because it wasn't just the physical torture. Yes, there was the physical tor- tor- torture. Yes, there was the being abandoned by his disciples. That hurt. But the, the real torture was as he hung there, um, our sins were poured into him. He who was perfect <clears throat> says he bore our sins. It says he became sin. He who knew no sin became sin. Can you imagine all of this? Think of the stuff that you've done, which I'm sure you can look back in your life and go, and you know, maybe you don't have to look back very far and go, oh man, that was ugly what I did. But it's not just your sin, but it's the sins of the whole world for all of history. All of that, Jesus became that. You know, if you're Jesus and you're perfectly good and you're holy, and instead of being holy now, you have become the sins of the whole world for all of history. That's torture. And then as a result of that, the real torture was when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His father abandoned him because sin has to go away from God, right? That's the torture that Jesus went through to give us forgiveness. There are some people out there who have, we all know, problems with Christianity. And for some of those people, one of the problems that they have with Christianity is Jesus on the cross. They'll say, why can't God just forgive us? Why can't God just say, you know what, never mind, it's okay, I forgive you. They'll say, why does there have to be this torture? Why does there have to be this sacrifice and blood? And, and it just seems so barbaric for God to have to do that in order to give us something good like forgiveness. And that just doesn't make sense to me and I can't swallow that. That is one of the arguments that some people have against Christianity. But we all know deep down, that the way that forgiveness works is that there is a cost that has to be paid. We all know this. So if you loan somebody your car, and they go out and they're driving around in your car, and they're texting, and they get in a wreck, and let's say they're okay, but your car is banged up pretty badly, um, the car now has to be paid for, right? The car has to be repaired or replaced, and somebody has to pay for that. If you are going to forgive them, then you eat that cost, right? But there is a cost. And that's true not just when there's a monetary thing. There's there's an emotional cost. If there's an emotional breakdown. But we know that this is how forgiveness works. That there's a cost that must be paid. We're all born knowing that we humans are messed up. That the human race has got issues. And that we look at war, we look at the news, we know that humans, um, we've done something and we've got the scales tipped against us. And we're the ones who did the tipping. And we all know this, whether you're religious or not. Now, there are some people, like the servant, like the first servant, who shut that out and there's no humility in them. And they just go, I'm, I'm just glad I've got what I've got. I'm just going to take whatever I can get out of life. And I don't owe anybody anything. But there are other people who are awake to this fact that the scales are tipped against us. And they go, okay, the human race is messed up, and something needs to be done to tip the scales the other direction. We, we humans want to get you know, better. We want to improve as a race. And whatever belief system you are, you believe that on some level. The scales are tipped against us, and something needs to be done to tip them the other direction. But for, Christ, for people who look at Christianity and say, I don't like that, that there's this sacrifice. Why can't God just forgive? 
Um, this is what we need to hear about Christianity. Christianity is unique and alone among all the world be- world's beliefs in its approach to this tipping of the scales. Because if you are a, if you're a non-religious person, you're a secularist, you don't believe in a God, then you might feel like, okay, the scales are tipped against me, and in order to tip them the other way, I just need to be good to people, I need to be kind, I need to practice random act of kindness, I, I need to um, repay the universe, or I need to repay humanity, or I need to be good to the planet, and then when I die, I want to leave behind more good than bad. And then maybe I've kind of tipped the scales, at least done my part to tip the scales back in my favor. If you're a, if you're a Buddhist, you all just saw a lot of Buddhists in, in Asia. Buddhists don't really believe in a god, but they do believe in this sort of cosmic oneness that we need to lose ourselves into and become part of this cosmic oneness. And in order to do that, you need to rid yourself of your sense of self. And that's up to you to do that. And you do that by chanting the right mantras and doing the right uh, meditations and performing the right rituals. And then maybe you'll tip the scales in your favor. Uh, You'll get reincarnated the right way. Hindus also believe in reincarnation. And if you're good enough, and if you sacrifice to the right God, and by the way, there are millions, and you may not find the right one in, in this life, so maybe the next life, you'll find the right God that you need to be sacrificing to. And if you do enough sacrifices and do the right rituals and prayers, then maybe you can tip the scales and pay the cost. If you're a Muslim, then it's up to you to adhere to the five, point, five pillars of Islam. And if you do that enough, then maybe Allah will grant you salvation and you'll have tipped the scales in your favor. Christianity is unique, though, and alone among all the world's beliefs in, in the way that it approaches this. Because Christianity also says, yeah, the scales are tipped against you. And the weight on this side that's tipping it against you is infinite. It's an infinitely large weight because when we sinned against God, when we rebelled against Him, when we turned against Him, we turned against a perfectly good God, an infinitely good God, and that's an infinite violation. It's not degrees of perfection that God's looking for, it's perfection. There's no such thing as degrees of it. So either you're perfect, in which case you're God, or you're not perfect, in which case you're us. And the difference between those is infinite. So Christianity says, yes, you're right, the scales are tipped against you and something needs to be done, but you can't do it, no matter how many good works you do. You can, you can pray the right prayers and go to worship every Sunday and read your Bible, and you can adopt 50 orphans, and you can memorize the Bible, and you can save 20 people a day through witnessing to them, and then you can jump in front of a bullet to, you know, to, to save somebody else's life and go out that way, but that hasn't put enough weight on the other side of the scale. Christianity is unique in that it says you can't do anything, but God has done it for you. Christianity says, yes, there is a cost, and it's too big for you, so God paid it for you. No other belief system in the world says this. Forgiveness is costly, and you can't pay it, but Jesus did pay it, and that's why we sing amazing grace. So when Jesus says, I want you to go out and forgive people, he's not going, I know it's, it's gonna, it should be easy. Um, it's $12,000 that the first servant was owed by the second servant, right? That's a lot of money. What was going on was that the, the second servant wasn't willing to pay that cost. And sometimes we're unwilling to pay the cost. When we look at the cost of forgiving somebody, when you think about the person who has done something against you and broken that relationship, and forgiving it means letting go of that brokenness, you go, man, that's, I don't know, that's going to hurt. Jesus goes, yes, I know. I know that forgiveness hurts. Jesus knows that forgiveness hurts better than anybody. So Jesus isn't, isn't going, just go out there for forgive. It's going to be easy, okay? Forgiveness is costly, and Jesus knows this. The second point that I, I want to look at is, is this, and this is so important. How many of you read this parable and you're, you're tempted to read it like, okay, Jesus is saying, if I want to be forgiven, then I need to go and forgive. If I go and forgive people, then Jesus will forgive me. Anybody feel like that's what it's saying? Because it looks like that. This is why it's important to read all of Scripture and to understand the big picture. Because what we see very clearly in Scripture is what I was just saying is the scales are tipped, 
against us and we can't do anything to tip them the other way. And so if Jesus was saying, you need to forgive other people and then you'll be forgiven, that's Jesus saying, okay, if you forgive enough, you can put enough on the other side of that scale and then I'll forgive you. And that's not what he's saying. So the deal with this parable is that it's, and hear these words, it's descriptive, it's not prescriptive, okay? Jesus isn't going, okay, if you want forgiveness, here's the prescription. The prescription is go out and forgive and then you'll get forgiven. That's not how it works and that's not what Jesus is saying. This is descriptive. Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like this. And the deal with the first servant is that it was actually revealed that he wasn't actually a citizen of this kingdom. That's why he wouldn't forgive. The problem with the first servant is that he received the money, but he didn't receive the forgiveness. Forgiveness was offered to him, but he didn't receive forgiveness. He just received the money. He just received the $6 billion and went out and blew $6 billion on his own and then came back to the master and says, I can't repay you, sorry, I used up $6 billion. And the master goes, okay, don't worry about it, it's forgiven. He just went, man, I'm glad I'm off the hook, get on with my life. Okay, hey, I need my $12,000 servant. I did the math here, by the way. $12,000 is one five hundred thousandth of $6 billion. So this would be like me having $500,000 in the bank and you owe me a dollar and you can't pay it and I, you know, I choke you and strangle you and throw you in jail and make you pay that dollar back. But this servant couldn't go, you know what, you owe me a dollar and that's okay because I've got 499,999 of them in the bank, so I'm all right. He didn't receive the forgiveness. He was not altered by that exchange. He didn't go, this guy just gave me $6 billion. And, and the, the master threw him in the jail and his family until the debt could be repaid. Did you, did you catch that? He's going to be in there the rest of his life. His kids are going to be in jail all of their lives. Their kids are going to be in jail all of their lives. This was going to turn into a generational thing if he did not, um, if the the king hadn't forgiven that debt. Generations of this guy's family were going to be just locked up forever. And the servant didn't go, man, this guy gave me $6 billion, and now my family for generations isn't going to be enslaved to him. And I don't deserve that. That's what was wrong with this servant. He wasn't humbled by this exchange. If he had been, then he would have gone to this other servant and said, hey, can you pay me back? And the servant would have gone, I'm really sorry, I can't. And he would have gone, you know what, it's okay. I've just been given $6 billion, so I can afford to give you $12,000. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, The servant was just thinking about himself. He was just going, I got $6 billion. Maybe I can get a little more because i got a lot of plans, lots of things I want to do. Um, forgiveness is what happens when we're humbled by what Jesus gave us. And we go, I did not deserve what Jesus gave me, so how can I not give you um, forgiveness? There's another thing going on here. The, the, the infraction between us and God is infinite, which means that the infractions between us and fellow humans is like this big. Because when you forgive somebody else, you're not forgiving somebody that you're better than. You're not better than the person you're forgiving. Or you're not better, let me put it this way, you're not better than the person from whom you are withholding forgiveness. You're no better than them. You've been forgiven a $6 billion debt. And so forgiveness may feel costly. So let's make this personal. Because James challenges us with with this. James says, don't read the word and just... Look at it and then not do it. James tells us that if you do that, you're fooling yourself. He says, don't read, don't be merely hearers of the word and deceive yourselves. He says, do what it says. Again, not prescriptive, not do what it says because if you do what it says, then you'll be forgiven. Do what it says because you've been forgiven. Do what it says because you've been humbled by God, because God is pouring into you and giving you a new heart and a new spirit. And he's giving you goodness that you don't deserve. So, um, as you hear this parable, 
Who is in your life that you're withholding forgiveness from? And, and in what way are you extracting payment from them? Maybe it's, maybe it's the way you treat them. Uh, maybe it's the way you ignore them. Um, maybe you're cold to them. Maybe you've just written them off and you have no hope for them. Now, let me be clear about something. Forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences all the time. It does mean no eternal consequences for us, right? Um, but if that person that you loaned your car to, uh, you know, crashed it because they were texting, you're going to think again before you loan them your next car, right? But that you can still cancel their debt and go, well, you know, I'm probably not going to loan you my car for a while until I see that that's not going to happen again. Um, and with, rela- <clears throat> with relationships, um, when people do, people do horrible things to each other. And, and when that happens, there are times to go, you know what, this, there needs to be some distance between us, but you can still not, not um, harbor hatred in your heart for them. You can still not wish bad things for them. Uh, you can still remember that God loves them and offers them the same chance at forgiveness and transformation and being made new that he offers to you as well. But who is the person that's in your life? from whom you have been withholding forgiveness. And maybe they did something really horrible. There was an incredible story um, years ago, a couple decades ago, uh, there was a guy who, I think it was up in Pennsylvania, went to this Amish village and killed a bunch of kids. Um, And this made the news. Because what this Amish village did was they didn't go, okay, let's get this guy executed. They actually offered him forgiveness. As a community, they came to him and said, we forgive you. The rest of the world looks at that and goes, that's crazy. Why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. The same rest of the world that would look at Jesus hanging on the cross and say, that doesn't make sense. Why can't God just forgive? They would also go, well, wait a minute. These people are forgiving this brutal thing. That doesn't make sense. That's right. It doesn't make sense. And that's what speaks about God that God would say, I forgive you what you've done at the cost of my son's life. That's how we should not make sense. That's a good way to not make sense to the rest of the world. The world should look at us the way that we live and the way that we forgive others and go, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you do that? Because when you do that, that challenges me. I would not be able to do that. That's how the world should be looking at us. Because then when they see God, when they go, that's because Jesus is in them. They've got $6 billion in the bank. Then they go, huh, now it starts to make sense. Jesus never said that life was going to be easier, that following him was going to be easy. Um, when we think about forgiveness, it challenges us. And uh, again, Jesus knows the cost. Jesus also said, though, that the way that leads to life is narrow and it's difficult. So don't come into this Christianity thing thinking, okay, this is going to be easy. I'll just pray and you know, go to, go, to, go to trips like Haiti, and, and that's going to be fun, and maybe some challenge, but then get back to my nice life here, and, you know, watch the game, and go to church on Sunday, and, and uh, be entertained by a band, and, and that's following Jesus. Jesus said, no, that's, I'm sure that's part of it, but following me is not going to be easy. I'm going to call you to do things that you can't do without me, like forgive. Um, but because I've given you $6 billion, you can forgive. 